Today we're going to look at a pretty cool infinite double sum that involves the Riemann zeta function. So let's see what we've got. We're going to take the sum as m and n are both bigger than or equal to 1, so they both trend from 1 to infinity, of m times zeta of m plus n minus 1 over m plus n squared. So let's observe that there's something going on here with the expression m plus n. So I think our first strategy or the first thing that we'll do will be to re-index thing, this thing to make m plus n its own index. So let's do that. So here we're going to set l equal to m plus n. But now how does this affect the upper and lower bounds of our indices? Well, let's observe that if m and n are both starting at 1, then that means that l must start at 2. And, well, l doesn't have a largest value because m and n both don't have a largest value either. But then what about the leftover index? Notice if l is equal to m plus n, that's only going to allow us to get rid of one of these indices, m or n. And so just to keep things kind of more alphabetical, let's get rid of the index n. And let's notice that m will tend from 1, so it still starts at 1, but now it'll start at, or end at l minus 1. And we see that it ends at l minus 1 because n, our original index, starts at 1. So that means that L is always at least one bigger than M, and that's what we have right here. Okay, so let's now rewrite this. So now this is going to be the sum, and we'll have L is bigger than or equal to 2, and then here we'll have M goes from 1 up to L minus 1, like we just discussed. And now what will we have? Well, we're going to have M and then we'll have zeta of L minus 1 all over L squared. So that's what we've got right now. Okay, so now let's box off this change of index over here so it doesn't make everything messy. And now let's observe that this zeta of L minus 1 over L squared in fact is a constant with respect to the inner sum. So just to be really thorough, that means we can factor it out of the inner sum, meaning that we've got this sum as L is bigger than or equal to 2 of uh, zeta of L minus 1 all over L squared. And now we've got that inner sum, which is the sum as M goes from 1 to L minus 1 of simply M. So in other words, we have 1 plus 2 plus 3 ending at L minus 1. But that's a very well-known sum. That's in fact a triangular number. It's the L minus first triangular number. And we should probably recall that the sum of this is L times L minus one all over two. Well, let's observe that we can multiply that out to one half, and then we'll have L squared minus L. So notice for the first term, the L squareds will cancel, and then we'll be left with a 1 minus L for the second term. So let's see. I'll bring this half out front, and then I'll have my sum as L is bigger than or equal to 2 of, well, what do we have? So it's going to be 1 minus 1 over L, and then we'll have this zeta L minus 1. But let's recall what zeta L is. So zeta L is going to be the sum as k goes from 1 up to infinity of 1 over k to the L. So that's the Riemann zeta function evaluated at L. But now we're going to subtract 1 off of this because we need this zeta L minus 1. But observe that we can subtract 1 from it simply by starting this index at 2. Because when the index is 1, we have a value of 1 for the term. That's essentially just taking off the first term here. That's what this minus 1 is doing. So let's see if we can write this out now. So we've got 1 half, and then we've got this sum as L is bigger than or equal to 2, and then this sum as K is also bigger than or equal to 2, of 1 minus 1 over L times, and I'm going to write this as 
one minus, or sorry, one over k to the l power. So something that looks like that. But now next up what I'm gonna do is, well, we're gonna make the observation in a few steps, but I'm gonna change the order of summation. And we can do that because these Taylor series that we'll see are absolutely convergent in the region that we're working. So I'm gonna do that and simultaneously multiply this through. So let's see, that's gonna give me a half. And then I have the sum as k is bigger than or equal to two of the sum over L bigger than or equal to two of one over K to the L power. And then we'll have minus the sum as L is bigger than or equal to two of, let's see, that's gonna be one over L times one over K to the L power. So that's what we're left with right now. Well, let's notice this, this first one that I'm underlining in pink is a standard formula for a geometric series. So let's go ahead and write that one up here and see where we can take the other term. So we've got one half and then our sum over k bigger than or equal to two. And then, well, like I said, this first one using standard rules of geometric series, that's gonna be what? Well, actually, before we do this next step, just to keep everything simpler, I'm going to change these sums to both start at one. And then let's argue why we can do that. Well, if you look closely, the L equals one term in both of these is the same number, so they would cancel out. So in fact, what I'm doing is I'm adding one in, or I guess I'm adding one over K into this term, and I'm adding one over K into this term, but this minus sign means they will cancel out. But that means I've got kind of a simpler formula for my geometric series. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to have my starting term, which is 1 over k, over 1 minus the common ratio, which is 1 minus 1 over k. And then what about this next term? Well, to me, it looks like some sort of integral has been evaluated. And I think we can see that a little more clearly if we look at this and see that it looks like one over L times X to the L evaluated from zero to one over K. I like to think of that as like a zeroth integral, but observe that we've got an exponent right here, which is exactly equal to our denominator. Now we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus part one to change this zeroth integral to a first integral by taking the derivative. But let's observe, that's gonna get rid of this L in the denominator, which is actually quite nice. So now we're gonna have minus this sum as L is bigger than or equal to one of the integral from zero to one over K of X to the L minus one DX. So we're left with something like that. But now, Again, because we're in this region of absolute convergence, which notice we're working with geometric series here on the interval from zero to one, not including zero and not including one, in which these series absolutely converge, which is back here why we could change the order of summation and why we can here change the order of summation and integration. Notice we're able to take this and rewrite it as the integral from zero to one over K of the sum as L is bigger than or equal to one of X to the L minus one, which is of course equal to one over one minus X using again, geometric series. But notice that's gonna give us minus the natural log of one minus X evaluated from zero to one over K. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So now we've got this half that we just bring down, and then we've got our sum k bigger than or equal to two. I'm gonna multiply the numerator and the denominator here by k to give me one over k minus one. And then here I'm gonna have a plus. This minus and this minus will cancel, and then we'll have the natural log of one minus one over k. And then great. So that's what it's looking like right now. But now let's do a bit of simplification right here and observe that this is in fact equal to the natural log of 
k minus 1 over k, which by logarithm rules is the natural log of k minus 1 minus the natural log of k. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. So let's bring that down. We've got a half, and then we have our sum as k is bigger than or equal to 2, 1 over k minus 1, and then plus natural log of k minus 1 minus natural log of k. Now, next up, what I'm going to do is re-index, and maybe simultaneously while I re-index, I'm going to change this infinite sum to a limit of partial sums, which is, of course, like how you find the value of an infinite sum in cases like this. So let's see, this is going to be a half, and then we'll have the limit as capital N goes to infinity. It'll be the capital nth partial sum. And then we'll have the sum as k goes from 1 to capital N. That's what I'm doing. I'm changing my index here to index down to start at 1, just so it's a little bit nicer. But that means that I'm replacing all of the k's with k plus 1's. So that's going to leave me 1, my, or 1 over k, and then plus, well, it's the natural log of k minus the natural log of k minus 1, or sorry, k plus 1. But that being said, what I can do here is split, split this into three sums, because now that I'm inside of the limit of partial sums, these are finite sums. So I've got my sum as k goes from 1 up to n of the natural log of k, and then minus the sum as k goes from 1 up to n of the natural log of k plus 1. Okay, so we're left with something like that. Now notice that the first term of this sum is 0 because the natural log of 1 is 0, so we might as well start this at 2. But that means that the first term of this sum is exactly the first sum or term of that sum. And in fact, all of these sums have the same terms, except the very last term of the rightmost sum, which has a value of the natural log of capital N plus 2, or sorry, capital N plus 1. So that means we can take this whole thing and write it as a half, the limit is n goes to infinity of my sum as k goes from 1 to capital N of 1 over k. And then like we just discussed, this you know, sum right here telescopes down to the natural log of capital N plus 1. And notice it's attached to a minus sign because it's the second sum that kind of survives here. So we have minus the natural log of N plus 1. And now we're almost done. This looks very, very close to something called the Euler-Mascheroni constant, but our index here needs to start or end at the same place as my argument of the natural log. So we can do that by ending this at n plus 1. And if we end that at n plus 1, that means we have to subtract off a 1 over n plus 1 so that we didn't change anything. But now, this limit right here is this gamma, this Euler's gamma constant. And, well, the limit of 1 over n plus 1 is clearly equal to 0. So in the end, we get the final value is this Euler-Mascheroni constant gamma over 2. And that's a good place to stop.